All right, so everybody, welcome to the Learn With Lowell Show. I'm your host, Lowell. Every week we discover and speak with experts, scientists, leaders from around the world. Uh, you know, please like, comment, whatever, if you want to. Um, I put out new episodes every week. Today we're joined with Dr. Jennifer Garrison. Is it Garrison or Garrison? Garrison. Okay, yeah, it's like when you garrison a castle. All right, Garrison, assistant professor of Buck Institute for Research of Aging. Also, I want to uh, give a shout out uh, to Allison. I don't know if I should say the last name because I don't want to dox anyone, but uh, it's someone on uh, Jennifer's team who helped put this together. So I just want to say thank you, Allison, for putting all the work in, you know, keeping everyone on track and stuff like that. So I just I always like to say thank you to people who help. But uh, Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And let me also chime in and say thank you, Allison. Um, she makes my life better every single day. Yeah. She, of, of the people who do that those type of tasks, she's like definitely in the top five. Like, she's, and I talk I mean, to a lot of people. She is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes people are, sometimes people can be kind of uh, grumpy and she was just always a pleasant. Even when she was like saying no or asking for clarification and stuff, she was always like, it was like extremely professional. I, I enjoyed it. It was nice. Good. Um, yeah. I'm not, I, I'm so, not, there's no hyperbole. I, she really does make my life better. <laughs> mm-hmm. The, uh, so we were, we were talking about this beforehand and I just kind of, I, I usually just pick whatever is the most interesting to start the conversation with. Um, we were talking about science funding a minute ago, and that is something I'm curious about because uh, we were just talking about our mutual love of Bell Labs and how we kind of feel like there was like a missed bottling of lightning. And I, I was talking about uh, Idea Factory as a book that maybe like could illuminate how they used to do it. But you were telling me that science funding is a little broken. The parts that I know are that a lot of fun, funding goes in, but innovation doesn't really come out in terms of a pliable IP that does things. Uh, like 99% I, of IP just kind of sits there. So uh, what when you say broken, what, do you, what are you imagining? Yeah, saying? I mean, that's, that's definitely one manifestation of, of what's broken. Um, I think... Uh, I think the incentive structures are, are, are completely backwards, right? That's, that's the main problem is that, um, I mean, of course, there's not enough, there's never enough funding, right? But with the funding that we have, um, the way that it's incentivized for people, you know, and the way that it's structured, it's basically set up so that um, it's producing incremental results. It's encouraging people to mm. do small, to make small steps, not giant leaps. Um, you know, for me, I run an academic research lab at a nonprofit um, research institute, and um, you know, we function just like any other academic center where all of the faculty here uh, support their own research programs. So, essentially, as a faculty member, you know, at a university or an institute, I'm like a small business, and so it's my job to bring in all of the funding to support my salary, the salaries of everyone who works for me all of the equipment in my lab, all of the, um, the supplies that we need, everything that we need to do the research, I have to bring in that funding. Now, um, oftentimes, you know, people can uh, help themselves a little bit by like getting some salary support to teach, or maybe the institution itself will give you some salary support, or maybe there's, you know, internal grants. But generally speaking, what I do is I write grants um, to the NIH, to the NSF, to private foundations, to individuals, to anyone really who has philanthropic money. And um, I write a grant typically um, in response to a call for grants. And so I write a grant on a specific project. Typically, it'll have like a couple of specific aims. And I talk through how I'm going to do it. Some grants are less structured, some are more structured. And it can be for a lot of money or for a little bit of money, for a small amount of time, for a large amount of time. Um, but what, the, what it means is that, and, and you know, the, the hit rate for grants is very low, even for really amazing projects, right? If you look at, for example, in um, the NIH, the National Institute on Aging, which is where you might apply if you were wanting to fund a project around questions related to aging research, um, you know, the, the pay line changes every cycle, but it hovers between like 9% and, you know, mm. like 20% if you're lucky. And that means that like everything that isn't in the top 9% doesn't get funded. And so there's a lot of work that is really meritorious, that's amazing, that doesn't get funded. But all of that aside, what I end up with when you look at my, my lab budget is a bunch of like a whole patchwork of different grants that are different lengths of time, different amounts of money, and they're sort of mm. hopefully a little bit overlapping so there's no gaps. And um, whenever I look at my budget, I have to look, you know, two years ahead because it takes nine months to even get your grant reviewed at the NIH. And, um, and the, the point of all this is to say that 
essentially, you know, when I write a grant for the NIH, um, it, it's it's there has to be a lot of preliminary data. I have to really enumerate everything I'm going to do, and I have to write a progress report every single year. And I need to show progress on the aims that I wrote about. Now I can, you know, I, if if something really dramatic happens and I really need to change the direction of the project, I can ask the NIH to let me change it. But generally speaking, you know. The reward is for super incremental, like advances, and also things that are um, kind of already obvious, right? Like they're mm. not funding giant blue sky projects that you know have no preliminary data that may or may not work. It's it's very incremental. It's based on a lot of existing data, and um, and I have to work on that thing. And so, you know, I'm I'm basically being rewarded for tiny progress. And so the way that I think that we can fix this is twofold. And, and I will say the NIH has, I mean, they know that this is not the way to fund science. Um, there, there's a mechanism called uh, HHMI in the US, so the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Do you, are you familiar with them? I know who Howard Hughes is, which is interesting <laughs> that his name is in, on a building still, but uh, it's not a building. Yeah, I, no, no, it's actually you mm. can go to their website, HHMI.org. It's, it's an, a kind of an amazing um, organization and um, they have a they have a research campus uh, in Northern Virginia, but they also they fund uh, investigators at universities and institutions all over the place, and so um, it's a very competitive process. And what's really brilliant about the way they structured their science funding is they do two things: they um, they fund the investigator and the lab not a specific project. And so that, you know, that's basically saying, you know more about your work than I do. <laughs> and you should have the freedom to when something happens in an experiment, and you realize you should go in a different direction than what you might have thought yesterday, that you have this, the freedom to do that. But then they also give them enough money so that they can fund a small to medium sized lab without having to apply for any other grants. Now they can apply for more grants and, and have a bigger lab. But it's um, it's enough money so that they're freed up to really focus on like thinking about the science and actually doing the science and um, the funding is for seven years so you get mm. reviewed every seven years and seven years is a good runway right the longest nih grants are five years and many are four years and you know smaller grants are usually for smaller amounts of time and the problem with that is you start down a path in two years in you the grant runs out, what do you do? Well, you have to write another grant for something else. And so you pivot your research a little bit. And instead mm -hmm. of like continuing on in one trajectory that might be really promising, you have to, you have to like fit your research to the questions that grants, granting agencies want you to, want you to work on, which is so backwards. Like the idea that we should be telling scientists they have to work on Alzheimer's disease, for example, is just like, ugh, drives me crazy. Um, anyway, HHMI is seven years. And if you get reviewed and you don't get renewed, they have a two year wind down period. So that means that you have nine years um, and plenty of time to find other funding um, to really do some impactful work. And if by and large, if you look at HHMI investigators and the kind of work they're publishing, it's, it's, it's impactful, it's, it's really um, top notch and it's usually very hefty you know and and these are the papers and the discoveries that you know lead to nobel prizes and that really push different fields forward um so that's an amazing you know it's very hard to get hhmi funding it's very competitive and um, it's like it's almost like winning the lottery if you're if you're a research scientist hmm. but that's one mechanism for what I would call sustainable funding. And I think that's what we need. We need to fund the ideas and the scientists, not a project. Um, and we need to, to provide some kind of sustainable funding so that they have the, cr the creative freedom to work on the problems that we think are really important. Um, sorry, that was a long winded answer, but I, I really, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I co-direct um, what ends up being a nonprofit a consortium that gives away grants to scientists and so i've been thinking a lot about how do we how do we um, within the confines of of what we have available to us how do we make this as impactful as possible and how do we make it so that we're not just like funding scientists to for two years to you know publish papers but how do we make it so that what we're asking them to do is really like flex their creative muscles and and do the most impactful science that they can do mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I, 
I see the what you mean by the downfalls of the of the system going on going on right now. If you, I mean, if 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 every couple of years you had to get a different job, like the, your the nature of what you're going to be doing that day changes significantly. Just like imagine it from like a regular person standpoint. Um, one thing that I do like about the current system is the the check ins, like the idea that you have to like like show that you're making progress. But the downside that you're saying at the same time is like they they really like incremental. So that you know, um, so I. So I like the idea of the longer runway. I also like the idea of like checking in. So if there's like some accountability for the money, but maybe there's like, there's accountability oh, yeah. for the longer way. I, I think accountability, I'm not saying there shouldn't be accountability. Accountability yeah, yeah. is really important. Um, but, but how that accountability is, um, is meted out is, is maybe the, the, the point. Um, you know, uh, I, I think from, from my perspective, right? So we've given away, we, we gave away one round of grants in 2020 to 23 scientists all over the world and um they're two-year grants and you know the the second year of funding was dependent on progress in the first but how you judge mm. progress is you know really yeah. can be really um uh different and now i'm at the stage where so we're, we're about to announce our second round uh any day now and we skipped a year for covid but the vision would be that going forward we have a round of grants every single year and that we have two tracks. And so one track is is for brand new investigators, because we always want to be bringing people into the space and, um, you know, as much as possible seeding, um, seeding the field. But then uh, the second track would be a track for existing investigators who already have grants from us to apply for a sustainable funding track, right, where mm. if they're doing something cool, if they're making progress, if we think they're going in a good direction, like keep going, <laughs> please. But all of this takes money, so it's you know we have to be creative about how we structure all these things. Would um, would it work? Would it work like to implement the system? I imagine like how do we funnel the money into the correct system of uh either what the the system that you're pr proposing or like some type of tweak where a bunch of people sit down and develop like a new NIH with this type of long term uh, um um uh, progress re report for lack of a better word, but like like a defined thing that everyone is is cool with how do we fund that um if it's from taxes i just imagine we it, it, i don't think we have like any amount of percentage of our money that goes towards just pure innovation and in, in this way like i think the majority of our innovation is usually for uh, the defense program but at the same time there are there are some things we do in, in this arena but then i think the I'm just trying to imagine, like, why don't we have a system like what you're saying? Because it kind of like marries all the ideas in one. You, you're you're proposing supporting the researchers who are going to develop the things that are going to change the world. Um, and I can see the benefit of that over the projects because the researchers, if they if they can be consistent with it, can do great things over the long term. Uh, and at the same time, like we we're, we're already we already addressed the having to change it up every two years, like that that sounds horrible, especially with science. Like it takes time to do these important things. Like I think uh, CRISPR for like. Christopher, for instance, I think uh, it's been out for a very long time, and only now have we seen clinical applications that are out there now. I think like the first two applications for CRISPR have been FDA cleared. And now, granted, that's not just you know lab work; that's you know also like FDA stuff, which is beyond that point. But it takes time to take like a kernel of an idea and go, go through this process, especially if there's like a series of valley of deaths that everyone knows about in the R as you develop something from idea to something like a CRISPR thing that's going to be implemented through the FDA. Um, so I was just yeah, wondering, how can we implement there. it sustainably? <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, how yeah. can we implement it sustainably? I, yeah. I guess like donations would be one. Well, so, I mean, this is a place where actually, you know, one of the reasons I started thinking about this was because I was, I, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to investors and, and people who are interested in trying to help change science funding, the DAOs, for example. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times people who have the best intentions end up like making things either worse or really having like a net zero um, mm -hmm. uh, impact because they fundamentally don't understand how science funding works, right? So one of the things you have to understand if we're going to talk about science funding is that um, every grant that I get from the NIH comes with um, the costs that fund my lab, but then it also comes with what we call indirect costs or overhead. And mm -hmm. a lot of foundations, a lot of private people, philanthropy, they don't want to pay overhead because they're like, oh, we want all the money to go to the science. 
But what they fundamentally miss when they when they say that is that guess what um, my lab is a physical place <laughs> where I need custodial services I need the lights to be on I need um, I also need you know the reason I'm at an institution and not in my garage is because I need the grants department I need the finance department to pay my people's paychecks I need the communications team I need um, you know I, I need all of those kind of I need all of that and uh, you know. I might the indirect costs or the um, the overhead covers all of those things. So they're not, you know, they're not dispensable. And so what happens is when there's a private foundation that says, oh, we're not going to pay any overhead, um, then whatever, you know, first of all, that will exclude a lot of scientists from applying because a lot of institutions will say, well, like if they're not going to pay the indirect, like there's there's the math has to work, right? Like we have we have to pay the salaries of everyone in the grants department. How are we going to do that? So a lot of people are, are barred from applying. So that's excluding people who could be doing great work. But then if you are allowed to apply, I'll tell you that it doesn't matter what the institution is. If you apply for a grant that doesn't have full overhead costs attached to it and you get it, that institution will get those costs from you somehow. <laughs> So they'll extract that money from your lab anyway, just through a different mechanism. And so, you know, so a lot of times I, I, I try to explain this to people and they just don't get it. Um, so it's really important to acknowledge that like, yeah, we have to pay for the space and we have to pay for the electricity and we have to pay for all of these things in addition to like buying the pipette tips that, that we're using to do the actual mechanics of the experiment. Um, mm -hmm. And sorry, I got lost there, but um, you asked me an important question, <laughs> which was, how do we get to the sustainability? So I will say, so there's, you know, I, it's not a negative message. It's a positive message. Things are moving in the right direction, I think. So the NIH is a, you think about the NIH, it's a governmental body. It's huge. Um, changing it in any direction is like changing, you know, like a giant battleship. You have to change it by degrees and it's incredibly slow and you might not even notice that it's moving in the right direction because it's you know moving so slowly but um they definitely have certain institutes within the nih have recognized that this is a great funding model and so um there is a funding mechanism that some of them have adopted it's just a single you know among dozens of different kinds of grants you can apply to there's a single one called the mira the it's called mm. uh, maximizing investigators research achievements i think or something like that i should know because i have one um but that's how i got that was the first grant that i got when i was uh an independent investigator from the nih was a junior faculty mira and essentially it's what we just said it's um it's a grant that funds like my research vision um not a specific project and so it gives it gave me the freedom when i started my lab to sort of do what i call follow your no science to really just to, to follow the, the, the results where they led, wherever that happened to be. Um, and it got renewed, so that must mean that I was doing something right. <laughs> um, but that, you know, so to put it into perspective, that's one grant and um, that's not nearly enough to fund my whole lab, right? So you need mm -hmm. multiple grants. But so at least they're thinking in that direction. And while it's not, it's not enough to fund my whole lab, at least it's there. Um, so hopefully, you know, hopefully this will continue to catch on. But I, I, you know, I think that from my perspective, I think that there's also this, you said, how do we get things, you know, how do we get to have IP and things like that not get lost or um, completely, you know, never see the light of day. I think that's a larger problem that has less to do with science funding and just more about the culture of science, right? We, we, as scientists, we live in what tend to be very siloed kind of um, echo chambers, and there's not a lot of communication either sometimes between fields, but oftentimes between the people who do the science, for example, and the clinicians who see the patients that that might be the, the relevant population that those scientists need to know about or um, you know, between people in the private sector and in academia. And I really think that the advances that are gonna most rapidly lead to products or therapies are gonna be made through those collaborations. And so, cause mm -hmm. you know, each one has unique expertise. Um, yeah. So a lot of what I do for the, 
consortium and for the grantees that we have is to try to build those bridges to try to force essentially people who don't normally talk to each other to interact. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see how how that works out. <laughs> Hopefully, well, it sounds it sounds a, there's a great nonprofit called New Harvest that does kind of it seems like they do what you're trying to do, where they for mm -hmm. cellular agriculture. They built out the infrastructure. They supported uh, postdocs doing research, uh, licensing of IP, so everyone could have like a, a standard to build off of that type of thing. And so they it required like a lot of people coming together. And so it kind of sounds like you're like on top of everything else you're doing, you're kind of building the, the structure of a nonprofit that brings everyone together to build the future that you are trying to see get built. That's right. Oh yeah, I wear a lot yeah. of different hats. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely doing that, and um, I think I think it's one of the most important things I could be doing. Mm -hmm. So um, we talked about funding. The uh, Well, sometimes I wonder, it's like, how much does it cost to actually run an average lab? And at the same time, I wonder uh, if there's overhead, you know, with grant financing legal from the university, mm -hmm. like, uh, it's like, what would be the, the cost if you found like a startup equivalent that will render the service for you for like pennies on the dollar? that you could uh, roll those benefits into everything else you're doing. But I'm sure there's like, I don't know, contractual reasons why you don't get to do stuff like that. Um, well, that's an interesting yeah. question. And um, I, I don't think, I actually don't think the barrier there is like contractual reasons. In fact, mm. um, when I can send something out to a facility or to a CRO, a contract research organization or something like that, I certainly do. And that's true for most academics. Um, mm. the, the parallel to that and the thing that's actually that that most academic scientists use a lot are core facilities, right? So it's it's like a parallel to what you're talking about. So most universities will have like, for example, a microscopy core that has, you know, dozens of really super fancy million, several million dollar microscopes that any individual lab like mine, like if I wanted to buy a million dollar microscope, I might be able to like find the funding to do that. But then that's mm. one kind of microscope, one thing, you know, and most labs can't, can't really um, afford to buy really, really expensive equipment. So what universities do is they have a core facility. It's like they keep it staffed with the best people and they have the most like cutting edge technology. And, um, and then as a university um, lab, I can pay like some small fee to use that microscope, right? And so the people in my lab can reserve time on it and get trained on it and mm. then use the microscopes. And so there's lots of different kinds of core facilities. So there's like sequencing cores and genomics cores that'll do like, you know, for example, um, you know, like all of the, the single cell omics or things like that. And um, our mass spectrometry, right? A, mass, a good mass spectrometer costs many millions of dollars and you're not gonna use it enough to want to have, <laughs> have your own. And so um, there are these core facilities that you can, you know, the pricing is really just tied to what the instrument costs and how much it costs to run it. And, you know, they have like internal and external pricing. So um, I have an appointment at UCSF, so I can use their core facilities at the internal rates. But if someone from, you know, Stanford wants to use the core, they can still use it if there's space and time, but they pay a higher price. Um, mm. And it's, you know, it's, it's all very, you know, it's, it works out pretty well um, for most things. Um, does that make sense? Does make sense. Okay, I, I can see what the university brings to the table. Then it, it, yeah. it felt like it felt like uh, you were like a hairdresser that was a an independent <laughs> contractor that you have to pay for your chair, and all the university did was just kind of like allow you to have the bubble of the brand to no, do your work. Well, and so it's that's part it of sounds it, like they do more. Yeah, they do, so do, they do more. more which and is especially good. yeah, where I'm at, I think um, we have we have the benefit of like really amazing, like like the administrative support is really important. Um, you know, like I said, Allison is my, she, she makes my life so much better. She's my chief of staff. And um, I think, you know, our grants department, for example, like the other thing to know about applying for grants is that most like private foundations, it's usually pretty simple, but the NIH, like when I put in a grant application, some like six or 12 pages, usually six pages of that is, a, is the science. And then it's padded with a hundred pages of like other stuff. And uh, there are rules, and if you, you know, if you accidentally break one of the formatting rules, your grant doesn't get looked at. You know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of red tape around just putting together a grant. And so the grants office not only helps us submit those grants, but they make sure everything looks right. And then when we get a grant, there's a lot of like paperwork and 
porting and all this kind of stuff and 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 that's what they do so we you know they they provide a lot of administrative support that's really important hmm. yeah I, I see the value now i'm glad we, we could talk about because i was just like is she <laughs> are, are, are universities across the land taking advantage of researchers but Maybe. so we talked about uh, <laughs> the I do wonder about like having like a, a sovereign fund where like all the grants and stuff got pulled and they they invested it, but only like as a percentage, like what Norway does with the oil money. But that's more of a how would you, how would you build uh, an amount of money that would then just like pay out for the rest of eternity, I guess. But um, talking about your research, so um, I believe if I was reading this right, you you, you go deep on neuropeptides, right? Okay, yeah. good. So uh, I. I looked up, I was doing research on what these are because it's like, oh, this is neat. Uh, it's been a while since I did a neurobiology course. So uh, I was I was reading about it. And I was like, how does this, how do these things affect reproduction and aging? Mm -hmm. um, so neuro, neuropeptides just like, uh, and this is like cited from Candle, ER, and 12 other people in Principles of Natural Science in 2013. Um, they said uh, neuropeptides are a class of signaling molecules that are secreted by neurons and act as neurotransmitters or neuromodulators to transmit messages within the brain across nervous systems. They, and then they list like, it does a lot of stuff, like a lot of physiological processes, pain, sensation, mm -hmm. stress, feeding behavior, like all these different things. And then they said, and reproduction. It's like, mm -hmm. it, they, it feels like neuropeptides are almost like the carbon of, of neurotransmitters or are they signaling things? But I'm just kind of curious, how do, how do these things actually affect reproduction and aging? Yeah, so, okay, um, there's a lot to unpack there too. So one thing to say is that, um, I, I know it sounds like it sounds like they just do everything, right? <laughs> you're reading this list and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, they just do everything. They're important for literally everything. Just, just you know, don't bother listing it. Just say all everything <laughs> that you care about in your body. That there's something um, related to neuropeptide signaling, and that's true in a way. And just to step back for your audience in case they don't really think about these things very much, um, neuropeptide is really a misnomer. So. They are mm. definitely used heavily and made by um, neurons, uh, but they can also be made and sensed by non-neuronal tissue. So it's kind of a misnomer. What we're really talking about is bioactive peptides. So, and, and the, like I said, the language is kind of sucky here because um, peptide, right? Like if you know anything about biology, you know, like proteins are basically chains of amino acids and short chains of amino acids are called peptides. Um, and, but what we're talking about is not like what you would get if you protein, you get like a bunch of little chains of amino acids that you would call peptides. Um, what we're talking about are bioactive peptides that are made specifically small, and they're made specifically in a way that is modified differently, chemically speaking, than like a protein. So they have lots of different modifications. They might be cyclized. They're just, mm. they are their own class of chemical that the body uses. And there are literally hundreds of them in, uh, in the human system. And there are probably a lot that we don't know about. And mm. um, I think about them kind of like the brain's Wi-Fi. So when I, you know, when I talk to someone who's not a scientist or not a neurobiologist, and I say signaling in the brain or neural circuit, they kind of immediately conjure up a, a picture, a cartoon diagram of what ends up being a synapse, right? So like mm -hmm. the end of one neuron kind of juxtaposed with the end of another neuron. And if you zoom in on that, you might see like little vesicles um, in one side and you see like an action potential comes down one neuron mm -hmm. and this is the axon. And then um, that triggers release of those chemicals that then signal to receptors that are on the postsynaptic side and then the signal gets transmitted, right? You know that picture, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is like signaling between two neurons that are physically connected. The synapse is a physical thing. And that kind of signaling is mediated primarily by neurotransmitters. So those are small molecules, so they're different than peptides. And there's like, you know, maybe like a dozen of those kind of neurotransmitters, and you've heard of most of them, GABA, glutamate, um, right, serotonin, mm -hmm. dopamine, they're small molecules. And that kind of signaling is super fast, like on the time scale of the nervous system, like milliseconds. It's directional, and it truly is between cells that are physically connected. It gets turned off really rapidly. Um, there's a lot of things about it that are super cool. Um, but peptidergic signaling, like neuropeptide signaling, is different. So 
while they can be released at synapses like that in response to an action potential, most of the time that's not how it works. They get released from different kinds of vesicles in response to different kinds of signals. And really, um, these are signals that happen on a much slower time scale, at least as far as the brain is concerned, more like seconds um, to minutes to hours. And they can signal over long distances in between cells or groups of cells that are not connected, right? So in the brain, they might coordinate distant brain regions, right? Like, so one group of neurons over here coordinated with another group of neurons over here because there's this chemical signal going back and forth. Or they could signal between the brain and the rest of the body and in both directions, right? So that's why I say it's kind of like the brain's Wi-Fi. So it's just, it's like a different mode of chemical signaling. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of and, having like a, yeah, instead of having like a physical um, nerve ending that like the, the type that runs from your brain all the way down to like your, your feet, it's a, it's a chemical that, that does the communication. That Well, it's always chemicals that are communicating at the synapse too, right? They're just released mm -hmm. from a vesicle and then they bind to a receptor that's right, right, next, right next door. Um, so it's, it's also still chemicals, although they're different, different kind of chemicals. Um, okay. And it gets really complicated because neuropeptides can also signal at synapses. They just have this other thing that they can do, which is travel over like long distances and long time scales. And when you think about it, right, when you think about any kind of signaling system like this, you have the signal itself, which in this case would be a neuropeptide. You have the thing that senses the signal. So we call those receptors, which could be anywhere. Um, like whatever cell happens to have the right receptor for the signal could potentially be a target. And then there's a, there's a third regulatory component that makes it even more complex, which is that there are um, enzymes that can degrade uh, or modify um, the peptide signal. And so those kinds of things, we call them peptidases, they can actually shape um, the timing of the signaling, right? How long, how mm. long something can be active, um, but it can also sort of shape the anatomic path that a signal could travel, right? So if like, for example, you have two cells that have the receptor on them and here comes the signal, but one of those cells also has the peptidase, then suddenly you get differential signaling there. So there's a lot of complexity mm. in the systems that make it kind of cool, um, but also I would say much more difficult to study than that kind of classical neurotransmission that we were talking about at a synapse, right? When you're looking at yeah. that synapse, there's no question what's going on, right? You can actually literally put an electrode into the presynaptic yeah. neuron and an electrode into the postsynaptic neuron, and there is no question about who's talking to who or what's going on. But when you're talking about these long range signals that 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 go over long distances and long time scales, it, it becomes, you know, it's a technical problem. But I would say we're, you know, we're we're well on our way to hopefully building tools that will help with that. But in terms of um, like, why is it that they can be um, doing all these different things? Well, actually, if I could, if I yeah, could just please. interject. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, sorry, how? No, uh, there's just so much. It's, it's very fascinating. How does how does it if if it doesn't have the the if it doesn't have the physical to, like i just imagine like you, you know you have the accident body and stuff like it's like a, a train you know passing luggage from one point to the on the other how does the how does one end know to get to the other side is it just like it obeys the whole body and the neurotransmitter and that like no, how does it know to go no, to where it needs to go no i don't yeah. think so um i mean that's i would say that's an open question for a lot of these signaling systems but no um in some cases we know that there are carrier proteins in some mm. cases, we know that, okay. um, you know, uh, in some cases, we know that the, the three dimensional space outside of cells in different tissues is not just like a bag of fluid, right? There's, there's yeah. really a lot of stuff packed in there. And so in practice, like things don't just diffuse all over the place. There's, there's really a lot of um, physical things restricting how, how chemicals like peptides can travel. And so um, I don't think we know enough about how that works, but I think that, you know, it's not just like, I think for, actually for a long time, people did think about peptides, like, like, they're just like, there's just like a sprinkler system, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, whatever happens to pick up the signal, that's, that's what gets it. Um, and, and we know now that that's really not, for the most part, how it works. Um, 
Mm. But, you know, how, how different peptides can travel over long distances, whether it's through a carrier protein or whether it like gets into the, for example, the CSF or into the circulation and that's how it goes. Or if there's something, mm. you know, if you're talking about traveling between distant brain regions, like how, like, what are those kinds of, and, and for the thing is that makes it a little bit, um, challenging is that for each individual neuropeptide signaling system, it's probably going to be a little different. And um, yeah, so, so and, and probably you'll find examples among different neuropeptide signaling systems that could, um, that would, that would reflect anything you could dream up about how it would get from one place to the other, mm. right? So in that way, it's kind of exciting, but it's also, you know, there aren't a lot of like hard and fast rules for how like all of the, all of the neuropeptides behave. They're all very different. Um, which is interesting from an evolutionary perspective, right? Like this is yeah. a, a, a signaling system that evolved early, like uh, humans and worms have about the same number of neuropeptides and receptors. And so, you know, it, it really did evolve early, but then it's been maintained that that diversity and that large number, that repertoire has been maintained over a huge evolutionary distance. And so there must be a really good reason <laughs> To, to keep all that complexity. And I have, you know, I mean, I can hand wave about why that might be, but there's a good reason that we have all of this. And I think um, from my perspective, I think that they, they really are a way for the brain. It's a way for, to encode flexibility in the nervous system. Because if you think mm. about like, how long does it take to evolve a new brain region? Right? <laughs> like, how many millions of years does it take to evolve a new brain region that would like do something different? versus how long does it take um, to make a mutation either directly in the, the coding region of a neuropeptide or a receptor or in the regulatory regions that would tell you like when and where it's expressed. Um, that's easy. And so that's the kind of, and, and these, are, these are the molecules that they mediate um, the affective components of behavior. They mediate mood. Um, they, mm -hmm mediate crosstalk between the immune system and the nervous system. And so, you know, that's a great way to innovate at the level of like a behavior, which needs to evolve much faster than you can evolve a new brain region, right? Yeah. It is anyway. interesting. Compared, uh, I think it's nematodes, right? The ones mm -hmm. that you research. Mm -hmm. uh, if you compare a nematode to a human, and I imagine it's been a very long time before we diverted in the family tree, how closely related is our neuropeptide system to theirs pretty close <laughs> there's not a one-to-one -one, so it's not like for every yeah. single neuropeptide in so humans the changes, there's a yeah. similar one but there is a lot of one-to-one -one. um so you know there's a lot of worm specific peptides and there's some human specific peptides or mammalian specific peptides but there's also a lot of um like convergence so you know one of the things that i what i did as a postdoc in corey bargman's lab um, at the rockefeller university was that uh, I characterized, like basically we found that there is an oxytocin vasopressin homologue in nematodes. And uh, I spent a lot of time figuring out what it does in worms. And what's crazy about the peptide itself is that um, you've heard of oxytocin and vasopressin before, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Those are neuropeptides. And they, we talk about them in the same breath because they're both um, nine amino acids. And they're identical at um, seven of those nine positions. And they also have all the same um, chemical modifications and things. So they're almost identical, but they do these two totally different things. Um, and that's another like really cool set of science stuff to get into. But the worm peptide is 11 amino acids, but it's nearly identical um, to, to, and it has features of both. So there's two amino acids that are different between oxytocin and vasopressin, well, the worm version, which is an evolutionary, you know, a, like a precursor, um, has features of both. And um, when we were thinking about what it might do, you know, we kind of like sort of circling around ideas that would be like really basic sort of, um, sort of like fluid homeostasis, right? Vasopressin is really important for fluid reuptake in the kidney in mammals. So we're like, oh, it's probably like, you know, regulating water balance or something. But it turns out that it actually was regulating male mating behavior. So, mm. so it's, it's um, conserved in ways that are, you know, conserved all the way across evolution, even at the level of behavior, which, you know, may or may not make you uncomfortable. 
<laughs> she like there's this nematode that only has a thousand cells <laughs> and yet <laughs> it has the ability to do these complex behaviors and it uses the same signaling molecules that we do to control reproductive behavior anyway um you asked me a really important question which is and i'm just talking and talking and talking um no i've been like, i'm enjoying it yeah <laughs> okay well you should feel free to interrupt me if you need to um but you asked, yeah. like, how is it that it can, like, neuropeptides can control, like, all these things at the same time? And, of course, it's that different peptides control different things. But if you think about the brain um, mm -hmm. and you think about reproduction, for example, um, let's say in women, um, I, think it's, I think it's a reasonable claim to make that the brain is a key player in reproductive success in women, right? It's... Um, it's important for pretty much every aspect of female reproduction um, from like childbirth and lactation to pregnancy and conception itself, um, menstruation, fertility, puberty, even childcare um, and rearing, mm. like the brain is, there are circuits in your brain that are controlling all of those things. Um, but you know, the brain is basically constantly listening to and integrating feedback from the rest of the body. And it's doing that through this like, dynamic ongoing chemical conversation between the brain and the reproductive organs that kind of determines what's happening in the system. And um, the language of that communication, I like to say is, we know some of the words in that conversation, <laughs> right, um, with respect to reproduction. So we know about steroid hormones like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. We know about um, uh, neuropeptides, some neuropeptides that control reproduction, like um, GnRH or kisspeptin or even oxytocin. But I think there's a huge number of things that we, we have yet to define. And so that's kind of where my lab works is trying to understand what all the components are and how they change with age. But you know, when you step back and, and look at where in the brain uh, is the control center for reproduction. It's in the hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. And the hypothalamus is an interesting part of the brain because um, it has a lot of neural circuits that are important for homeostasis. Um, so body temperature regulation, fluid and energy homeostasis, um, circadian rhythms, and reproductive function. And those neurons are all intermingled. They're like all mixed up. It's not like the cortex where there's this beautiful, like physically defined layers with like, you know, neurons in different layers have different architecture and you can tell where you are by how things look. In the hypothalamus, everything's all mixed up. Um, and some of those neurons that, for example, control the circuits for fluid homeostasis, there's some partial overlap between those neurons and the neurons that control, for example, like energy homeostasis. And so when you start to focus like female reproduction, for example, through the lens of the brain, suddenly some, things start to make a lot more sense because those neurons that are controlling um, fluid homeostasis, for example, they're not just controlling the physiology, they're controlling the associated behavior and, and through these signaling molecules like neuropeptides. So like for fluid homeostasis, they definitely control like how much water you're retaining by modulating your kidney function, but they're also controlling drinking behavior, <laughs> like how mm. much you're taking in. Um, and they're controlling mood and emotion. So suddenly, like when you start to think about like, I don't know, um, the constellation of like physical and emotional symptoms that are associated with menstruation or motherhood or menopause, suddenly, you know, things start to make a lot more sense because all of these homeostats are in the same place. And the whole basis for my lab is just thinking like, okay, there's an age-related increase um, in inflammation, specifically in the hypothalamus. Lots of labs, Dong Shenkai and others have shown that. Um, we don't know cause effect. We don't know anything about that. But what we know is that, what I think is that changes in those homeostatic circuits with age um, might be one of those like first dominoes to fall with respect to systemic aging, right? You m mess around with the fluid homeostat, for example, um, and that changes with age, then maybe that conversation changes. And that is, you know, one of the things that leads to what we consider you know, like hallmarks of aging. So that's, that's why I think it's important to know what that conversation is and then to see whether or not we can use any of those 
those words as intervention points for extending health span. So the so fluid was being dysregulated, it would like the reproductive organs wouldn't get like the nutrients they need and then they start to get degrade or how would it affect that? No, it's more direct than that. Um, I mean, okay. yes, I think I think actually I do think that hydration status is one of the most overlooked but important um, things that you need to pay attention to in older humans. And I'm talking about healthy older humans, but um, but that aside, no, I mean, like literally the neurons that control fluid homeostasis in the hypothalamus are partially overlapping with the neurons that are important for reproductive function. And so, mm. you know, when you're thinking about something like menopause, why is it that one of the main symptoms of menopause is like, is hot flashes? Well, it's because that part of the brain, <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's getting dysregulated in lots of different directions. And, um, and maybe those neurons that, that sense estrogen from the ovaries are also, you know, um, responsible for regulating your body temperature. And when, when your ovaries stop making estrogen and those neurons get all messed up as a result, like that impacts your ability to regulate your body temperature. Um, you know, there, everything is like connected there and mm -hmm. not directly necessarily, but there's a lot of overlap in those systems. Um, so, and I don't think we fully understand just how they impact each other, but that's, that's the beauty of, you know, of, uh, follow your nose science. <laughs> yeah. How would, um, so I'm used to the uh, research being something like rats or um, I guess nematodes as well. How would we replicate like uh, a human who's gone through menopause and then giving them um, everything they would need to ha like it. If it's like just a, uh, like a chemistry thing in the brain, if we just reintroduce those, those components, would they be back to being able to be fertile and have a normal reproductive cycle? I mean, that would, that would be the goal. Um, I think that we have some hints that that might be possible, but, um, but I would say that we, I don't, I don't know, but that certainly, hmm. you know, that would be one of the hypotheses. I think um, there's a lot, again, to unpack there. Uh, one thing to say is that when we're talking about reproductive aging, because like, we're kind of like backing into this from a different conversation, but we're talking about reproductive aging in females then um, we don't have, first of all, we don't have a lot of information at all about how that works. We really don't fundamentally understand what goes wrong or when. Um, we know what the downstream consequences are for sure, like with respect to fertility or birth, uh, uh, miscarriages or things like that. And we know what the downstream consequences are with respect to menopause, but we don't understand the causal underlying factors there. So, but we do know like there are some experiments that have been done that point to um, the existence of what we would call like, um, you know, uh, paracrine factors or things that, you know, signal outside of the signal for long distances, essentially, um, that could be beneficial, but we don't know what they are. We don't know what would be the right timing. We don't know any of that. So, um, and I would also say that we don't have any great models specifically for menopause. Um, because menopause is something that is really unique to humans. It's just us and a few species of whale and maybe one species of non-human primate, but that's a little controversial, that go through menopause. So um, developing new animal models, developing new um, ex vivo like organoid models, developing anything that would help us better emulate what happens during menopause so that we can test these questions is um one of the things that we find grants on because <laughs> it's really mm -hmm. important yeah the it sounds really complicated it, it, yeah. like i'm just i keep picturing the lifespan to io where they have like the like a big chart of all the things that need to come together for an intervention and aging to happen and mm -hmm. I, I just imagine like all the different hypotheses you could be testing just to see what is real what is not because it, it seems from uh, an outsider point of view because I'm, I'm not a woman uh, it doesn't seem like women's reproductive health is really given the priority that it needs and deserves over the last, at least my in my age. I was born in like the 90s. Um, I think even like uh, there's some reproductive, no, uh, there's some elements of like what women need that's like a luxury item tax. It's like, I don't know why it's a luxury item. I don't think women would consider it a luxury item. 
But um, I mean, I I would obviously agree with you on that. Um, I think yeah. I think there's um, well, I mean, you can start just with women's health in general. Forget about reproductive yeah. aging. Just uh, I think women's health in general is is both underfunded and understudied, and you know we have hard data to support that. And yeah. there's a lot of different reasons for that. I think primarily there's the lack of funding, but there's also the, like the societal taboos that have existed around women's bodies you know the public mm. discourse about things like menstruation or pregnancy or menopause or just really anything to do with women's bodies was kind of verboten until not that long ago and there's a moment happening now around breaking those societal taboos and i think that's really unleashed a whole like a really to put a positive spin on it a really amazing movement to say like wait a second <laughs> How is it possible that we don't know the answers to these questions? How is it possible that we don't have, for example, a diagnostic health panel that would tell a woman where she is in her reproductive span trajectory? Um, but the other piece of it is really that I, I think male bodies have been biology's baseline for all of basically all of human history. And so we yeah. haven't done the, the studies I mean, that's why we're doing what we're doing with the consortium yeah. um, is just to to fix that, to really to stimulate research in the space as much as we can. And also just to grow, like you said, the ecosystem around this particular scientific discipline so that everything that's discovered by our grantees and by anyone else who comes into the space, that it can be translated faster and made into products and diagnostics and therapeutics faster for women. Yeah. Um, I heard from some of my friends who are doing clinical trials that a problem they have is getting women to participate in them. Like that is actually really hard to get like a, um, a diverse panel of people in a clinical trial to normalize out. That'd be good for the whole population. That's why I, I think, they, I think someone was explaining to me, that's why a lot of drugs work better on people that look like me. And people who don't, it's because like apparently people like me are, are willing to have people inject drugs into them. As far as I, I understand it, um, how do we yeah. incur? Oh, okay, <laughs> you, you disagree? No, I'm not sure. I disagree as much as um, I, I'm not sure that's the primary problem. I think hmm. that um, I mean most of the women I know are, are dying to participate in studies. Um, okay, but I think that there, like, there was. Um, I think it was in the early 80s that um, the FDA mandated that clinical trials had to be done in both men and women. And before that, that wasn't true. And at least in biomedical research, and I think also in clinical trials, women were purposefully excluded. So female oh. animals were purposefully excluded from biomedical research because, you know, it turns out that our ovulatory cycles and those hormonal orchestras that are happening they introduce complexity into the system. There's no question that um, that that is more more complex. And so, um, you know, I was I was I was told as a PhD student, like only use male male mice in your studies. Don't don't use females. It'll it'll muck up your data. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for clinical trials, you know, I think there's um, there's always the fear of lawsuits and. Uh, women, particularly women of childbearing age, I think that you know I, I, that people um, doing the trials wanted to avoid any kind of um, you know thalidomide style uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, controversies. So I, I think that they were purposefully excluded. Um, I don't think it was necessarily that that women don't want to participate. I, I think that okay, yeah, that's, I see that point. Yeah, yeah. I could see how. It'd be a series of dis discouragements or literally don't use those mice. Uh, you're getting, it'd be, it'd be um, kind of amusing. I guess if, from my point of view, if I were you, if one of the biggest things you do is just start adding, you know, uh, female mice, and then we start tracking complex systems better. Like it'd be, it'd be interesting. I was wondering like, what's the first domino that starts hitting and then does these bigger things. Mm -hmm. And so if we, if one of like, one of the biggest things you do is just like a part of your grants, I uh, was mandating that you had to have a diverse population for the the, the trials, and then mm -hmm. that started like a whole cascade of things. Not saying that that is ultimately what you will be known for, or the biggest thing, but I always wonder, if, what if that's the domino that like causes all these other great things to come from it? 
Well, um, I have to say it won't be me. I mean, these, these things have already been mandated. Um, the NIH mm. mandated in 2016. But in 2016, like it's 2023, that wasn't yeah. very long ago that um, that anyone getting a grant from them had to use both males and females in their studies or or justify why they wouldn't. Like if you're studying, for example, the vas deferens, you probably don't need females. but. Um, but, you know, that was 2016 is when that was mandated. So things are changing in a positive direction and, and females are being included in studies, but it's taken a very, you know, it's it's just starting. Like, we're just like, we're just starting to collect this data. So there's a lot of opportunity, but there's also just a lot of things that we don't know that we should know um, had, had we been doing this the whole way through. And, you know, men have suffered as a result too. If you think about like COVID-19, there's so many... There are so many things about our health and um, about the way our immune systems behave that are sex specific. Um, like, what would we, where would we be with COVID-19, right? Men are more susceptible to dying from COVID-19 and they're also more susceptible to severe disease. Um, but, you know, by not studying both males and females, like we've, we've basically blinded ourselves to whatever those specific vulnerabilities are that affect the different sexes. And so mm -hmm. I, I really think that there's there's an important reason to include females in in studies for for men as well, and for you know for ovarian aging I always say this but but people uh, rarely take note when you look at ovaries right which from the perspective of longevity interventions that you mentioned earlier like how do we do clinical trials for longevity or health span interventions ovaries are the like the time machine we need. Because um, the big elephant in the room, right, if you have something that you claim is going to extend health span, how do you test it? Well, you have to find some, some proxy that uh, is measurable and that the FDA will, will let you um, test. And aging obviously isn't recognized as a disease. So how do you, how do you test a, um, an intervention that might extend health span? Well, ovaries are aging prematurely, right? They're starting to age when a woman's in her 30s. And so um, you can imagine using ovaries as an accelerated model for human aging. So taking young women in their 30s. Um, oh, and I should mention maybe a really important piece of information to know is that many of the pathways, um, for all the pathways that we've looked at in ovaries that are important for aging in other tissues, you know, things like um, mTOR signaling, you know, all the big ones. They're also operating in ovaries and, you know, interventions that uh, change aging in other tissues also have a positive impact on ovarian aging. So what that means is that if we can understand why ovaries are aging prematurely, it will give us clues about aging in the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you could take a health span intervention and test it in, you know, a two or three year clinical trial with women in their 30s and ask very simple questions, extremely simple metrics and outcomes, um, pregnant, not pregnant, uh, bone density, uh, hormone levels, lots of things you could measure to look at ovarian function that would give you a sense for whether you are having a positive um, impact on ovarian function and there and extrapolate towards um, thinking about health span. Anyway, um, that's just yeah, <laughs> an aside. No, it sounds very exciting, though. Um... I mean, everyone, everyone has a mom. And so everyone should care about women's health. I think. Well, I mean, I, that's actually, I would argue that's not why you should care about women's health, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. everyone has a mom or a daughter or a sister or a friend or a partner um, who might have a pair of ovaries or at least one ovary. Um, but I would argue that you as a man should care about this because, um, because yeah, because it's, a, it's like, it's a really, it's like a shortcut to, to finding not just pathways and genes that control aging in the rest of the body, testing mm -hmm. interventions that might impact aging in a way that's tractable in our lifetimes, but also because, you know, the age at which a woman goes through menopause, right? It's called um, age at natural menopause or ANM. Um, first of all, it's really variable, right? So different women go through menopause at different ages and the span of normal menopause is like 14 years. So if you go through menopause before 40, it's early. If you go through menopause after 54, it's late. But how in the world is it possible that there's so much inter-individual variability? Um, but 
uh, the age at which a woman goes through menopause is correlated with overall lifespan. It's a correlation. We don't understand like what the cause, like what the relationship is there, but it's a really strong correlation. And so um, if a woman goes through menopause later, she'll tend to live longer. Um, and the converse is also true, but that extends to male brothers. So for women who go through menopause later tend to live longer, so do their male brothers. So there's some genetic component there that's important to okay. understand that has, yeah, that crosses um, sex, biological sex. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Yeah. Usually when I'm getting yeah, no, a talk really and I get to that slide, the men who have been sort of like twiddling their thumbs or like, you know, not paying attention, they suddenly like perk up and start texting their sisters. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah i don't know um i was wondering could if we understand it well enough could we decide when menopause like um like i imagine like to give people ownership over their reproductive health instead mm -hmm. of having to take a pill or something because you just like induce a form of menopause so that people can be like okay i don't want to have this function right now like or like the downsides of the function but then if they're like 45 and they want to have it, they activate the reproductive system back. Or maybe is it like the switch swapping would be inherently bad due to the regulation that it does? Well, um, I don't think anybody would ever, I think if you had a choice, nobody would actually choose to go through menopause. And I say that um, not from the perspective of having babies. I think hmm. there's, a, there's like a common misconception that um, all we're talking about here is having babies. And certainly that's a part of it, fertility, um, and menopause are really intricately linked, obviously. Menopause happens when a woman runs out of eggs, essentially, right? Um, so, you know, a female human is born with all the eggs that um, they will ever have. And the number starts around like seven million, six or seven million before birth. And then by the time birth happens, it's dropped to one million. And then by the time puberty happens, um, it's dropped to like 300,000. And then, um, you know, every month that a woman is cycling, she'll lose a thousand eggs. Um, she'll ovulate one, but 999 will die. Um, and and so, you know, a woman will ovulate somewhere between three and three and four hundred eggs in her lifetime. But she started with seven million. And so, why is there that attrition? We don't know why. Um, you know, and it's not just the number that's declining, but also the quality. And so, those are the kinds of you know, at the in like the beginning parts of um, adulthood, all of the symptoms of that decline in egg quality and quantity are manifested on the most of the time with fertility issues. Um, <clears throat> but what also is true is that when ovaries stop working at menopause, they have been um, making this, we were talking about this complex cocktail of um, hormones, of chemicals mm -hmm. that are important for um, general health, right? So going through menopause is essentially making a woman's body age faster. It increases risk okay. of cardiovascular disease fourfold. Like um, it's dramatic what happens after menopause in terms of risk of having a cardiovascular event or a stroke. Um, it increases risk of osteoporosis and arthritis and cognitive decline. Um, there's a whole list of things that happen which are really detrimental to a healthy woman's body. And um, I think there's um, a lot of reasons why that happens, but I, I think there's a real case to be made for just trying to maintain overall health by maintaining ovarian function. And it takes a lot more than functioning ovaries to have a baby. Right? <laughs> you also mm -hmm. need a lot of other things to be working properly. And so we're not talking about what we're what we're advocating for is just to understand what causes ovaries to age prematurely. And ideally just to like sync up aging in the ovaries with aging in the rest of the body, right? I would never argue that your body is aging totally synchronously, but just in general, in, in terms of at least functional decline, you know, most of your organ systems are declining um, <laughs> kind of around the same rate. There's some differences, right? But um, but ovaries for women, like, like if all of the other organ systems are like kind of, you know, like this, ovaries are like, boom, tanking in midlife and aging in the male reproductive system happens too, right? You're going to undergo male reproductive aging. 
But the difference is that your reproductive system is going to age kind of at the same rate as the rest of your tissues. And so ideally what we want to do is just sync up ovaries with aging in the rest of the body so that we can maintain overall health and also um, provide women, you know, the agency and the, the, the freedom to choose if and when they decide to have a healthy child. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Is that, um, what's causing it to happen sooner? Like that you're saying that, um, over time it's been happening more like in the thirties when they start having these problems. So what's been happening? Is it just like we're studying it better so we can see that it's happening? Like menopause or these other things that are well, affecting menopause it? happens usually, the average age, age of menopause hasn't changed in a very long time. I think okay. it changed by one year over the last hundred years. So average age of menopause is I think 51 and some change. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, there's a huge span of norm, normal. Yeah. Um, and if, actually, you know, if we could just understand why so much inter-individual variability exists, that would give us some clues about what's going on. But but no, that's the that's the bazillion dollar question is what what is the causal factor or cue or timer or constellation of cues and timers that so reproducibly tell a woman's ovaries to start aging when she's in her late 20s, early 30s, when everything else is working pretty mm -hmm. much um, at peak performance. Um, so that's that's really that's that's what we want to answer. Yeah. What. Um, so for. 2023 uh are are you going to be working on any of these in particular any, any of these hypotheses? Me personally yeah you are uh through the grants and stuff i mean yeah that's um that's what we fund the grants to work on is just to try to understand like what are the underlying mechanisms of reproductive aging in, in females and um like i said we don't know we genuinely don't know why the decline in number or the decline in quality of eggs we don't know where along that trajectory like the important mm -hmm. stuff is happening so we cast a very wide net um and again i i don't know more than the scientists who are doing the work and so um you know we choose the the most promising seeming and creative projects and the the most creative people and we we try to basically not just give them money so we give them grants but we're also trying to build resources for them, right? So you know how we were talking about core facilities? Um, we built the world's first ovarian biology core facility. <laughs> and the reason we did that is because we want as much as possible, if we're going to grow this field kind of from, from the beginning, um, we fund postdoctoral fellowships because we want to see the next generation of, of leaders, but we also want to pull in people from other fields, right? Like we want the most talented people from other fields to think this is important and to start working on this. But as a scientist, you know, it's, it, there can be a real um, activation energy or a barrier to entry to start doing something new. And, and, you know, I'm a neuroscientist. I wasn't working on ovaries five years ago. And so when I, you know, came into the space, uh, having, having a core facility that I could go to and um, collaborate with or work with, to learn how to like do experiments in ovaries, for example. Anyway, so we we provide them a lot of different. We try to be creative about how how we support them beyond just giving them money. Um, so mm -hmm. that means like facilitating collaborations, um, thinking about like databases and tissue biobanks, and um, we have now these international conferences where we bring everybody together so that we can have you know like big brainstorming sessions about what we should do to push things forward faster. Um, we put together a translational advisory board for just the things that you were talking about. So really expert heavy hitters in different aspects of R&D and pharma and biotech and funding um, so that when there is IP that comes out of these labs that 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 we can help them as, translate things as fast as possible. What what help do you need? Like you're supporting all these people. <laughs> anyone, yeah, anyone listening in or I don't know. Any, what what help do you need? Yeah, I mean, well, for the consortium, um, we I, I, I we have an incredible partner in our seed funder and my co-founder. So Nicole Shanahan and the Biaco Foundation are really they are the people who um, who recognize this as a problem early. And I mean, in 2018, Nicole came to the Buck Institute and gave us a grant to start a center here at Buck. This is how it all started. 
she she recognized that this was an important problem. That there was absolutely nothing happening in this in this research space, and she asked if we would start a center to study female reproductive aging, and we did. Um, and like so, there is a center here at Buck, like a physical place where there are scientists working on this. And and the minute we started the center, it became just really apparent that if we were going to make a difference, we had to do something much bigger. And so that's where the global consortium was born from. So mm -hmm. we have the center, we have the global consortium. We planted a second center in Singapore. Um, and the global consortium is really meant to encompass like literally anyone in the world who has an interest in the space, scientists, doctors, um, BCs, uh, companies, early stage biotech companies, um, literally anyone who has an interest in the space. And um, yeah, so what I need is I, I honestly two things. One is what you're doing right now, which is just giving me a platform to talk about this stuff because there's there's like multiple layers of just necessity for getting the word out, right? At the most basic level, the most basic fundamental level, women do not understand simple things about their own bodies. And as a mm -hmm. result, they are not armed with the information they need to like, plan, like plan properly. And I'm not saying that women in their 20s should go out and like get pregnant because they're at their peak fertility, but they should have all of the knowledge at their fingertips about what's going to happen in five years and 10 years and 20 years so that they can make informed decisions as they're like mm -hmm. planning their lives. So a lot of what we do is like actually just information based, you know, we're building a knowledge hub where women can come to learn about um, different aspects of reproductive function. Um, but then on the other side, uh i'm all, as much money we have the biaco foundation we have this amazing partner and we have a certain amount of money we can give away for grants but as much more as i can raise we can give that away so i'm i'm raising philanthropic money to try to give away more grants um i also need i basically am looking for matching funds so that we can build that sustainable funding path for the existing grantees mm -hmm. to apply to um so yeah so that, that the not a big nothing big just <laughs> yeah ideally but, um you know from my perspective i think that the perfect system will be one in which um we're able to in a few years and we cannot do this right now because there literally is no ip all of the ip that exists in this space is around um what I would call the band-aids and they're like, we need the band-aids. Don't get me wrong. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of VCs interested in funding med femtech, which would be like diagnostics and products, um, and biomarkers, which is great. But what I want is a, I want therapeutic interventions. So I want things that will actually change, you know, the trajectory of a woman's, um, uh, reproductive lifespan. And so on that side, there, there's very few companies. And the reason for that is because we don't, like we don't have the IP because we haven't done the experiments because we haven't made the discoveries. So I think for the next several years, we have to invest in the basic research, but eventually there will start to be IP that's generated here. And then we can think about like accelerators or models to take that IP, foster those early stage companies, build those companies, and then hopefully have some little bit of that come back into the, the academic side and fund the grants and maybe there will be a sustainable cycle that it happens. But to get there, like um, what I really need is like, you know, a, a, what I would consider like an endowment. You know, I'm trying to mm -hmm. build a, a pile of money that we're not just giving away every time, but that would allow us to give away the money um, and then yeah. to hopefully build this whole system. So, yeah. No. Oh. It uh, makes sense. The, uh, there was a there was a time where I had like three or four of my female friends coming to me. Now that I think about it, I don't know why they came to me for these things, but they were having problems <laughs> with their. <laughs> well, I was just, uh, they were having problems with their o OBGYNs, um, mm -hmm. where uh, they were they were like in their mid twenties. They were having a problem, which was like uh, one of them was having like I'm not naming their names, so I think I can say these things. The um, the uh, some of them were having like andrometriosis type symptoms yeah. and they sat down with their OBGYN and the OBGYN was like, so do you want to be using your uterus? And, and I was like, what? Like, I was like, why would they ask that? And like, so the first thing they did was like, do you want, are we going to like hysterectomy you when they, when they Which first sat down? Yeah. And yeah. that's and not, like, not, that's not a good, not a good path. <laughs> yeah. So they, 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 they called me because, um, kind of like uh amongst my friend groups i'm kind of like the doctor whisperer in terms of like how to how to ask doctors good questions so that they don't kill you and so so then uh so it's like all right well Pro here's tip. some questions you might want 
<laughs> Here's some question you might want to ask, but I think that doctor might be just like a, it's like a, like a, like a, like a, a butcher. I mean, like you first sit down, they pull out a pad of prescriptions and they, they immediately ask you, do you want it, Do you want your uterus or, or do you, you know, can we get rid of it? It's like, I don't know. That seems kind of extreme. So like, Super uh, extreme. It, was getting, yeah. it was getting to the point where it's like, it was always irritating me enough. Just like imagining like thousands and thousands of women having similar conversations. And then uh, I started talking to some doctors and apparently there's like, there's doctors out there that, that as soon as they hear a woman in the, like their forties or fifties having a problem, they'll like, they immediately try to do hysterectomies and stuff, which is just disgusting. Um, like no yeah. like actual regions. Yeah. But anyways, um, so can I, this, can this, I, oh, can yeah. I just, um, just to, sure, yeah, uh, you can interrupt me. No, I, I mean, I just, okay, cause I, I, I don't want to forget to say this cause I think it's really important. Um, I think there's, um, there's many things to say there. And I, I agree with you that that's, that should not be the first path. Some, there are extreme cases where that really is yeah. the only option, but th- those are really at the, those are like the edge cases and not like what should be the the normal path um, for treatment. And I, I just want to like, I want to balance this by saying, I think that most doctors, their, their motivations are pure and they want to help mm-hmm. their patients, but there's yeah. like genuinely no information So they're operating on nothing. They don't like, we haven't, we know now that keeping your uterus is important, even if you don't want to use it. Um, there's a lot, like, there's a lot of evidence now. There's huge numbers of studies showing that a lot of bad things happen when you take a whole organ out and, you know, good to keep your uterus if you can. Um, but there's just, there, there's a problem at many levels here. So one is that the doctors don't have the information they need right? Mm -hmm. Partly because the studies haven't been done. So, you know, what do you do for endometriosis? How do you even diagnose endometriosis, right? Like many women have things like endometriosis or PCOS, or they call it POI, um, which is like ovarian insufficiency, which basically means like, well, we can tell your ovaries aren't working properly, but we have absolutely no idea why. (laughs) Um, So we're just going to, you know, give it this, this term. Um, but we don't know how to diagnose those things. We don't know how to treat them. And w- so yeah. doctors don't know what to tell women, right? Because there's just nothing. There's really, they don't have a lot of tools at their at their disposal. And as the research comes out, they don't have time to educate themselves, right? So that's part of what we're doing on that, re- that knowledge hub is it's a place for women mm-hmm. to come, but also a place for scientists and, and doctors to come where uh, the most superficial level, and the goal here is simply that, You know, right now, if you type in endometriosis into Google um, or PCOS and you're a woman looking for information, what comes up is like lots of factoids that if you click on them will take you to a company that's trying to sell you something, which could be good or bad. But, you know, we're basically where we're like, what what happens to me? What what just happened? You described happened to you. Yes. My friends, my friends of friends. My family members will email me and say like, okay, I just got diagnosed with XYZ. What do I need to know? And then I drop everything and I spend half a day like getting Mm -hmm. the doctors in their area, telling them what they need to know. Here are the studies. Here's this. Here's that. Here's the other thing. And I'm like, oh my God, what if you don't have a me? What if they don't have a you? Like, what are they doing? Um, And so most women are just like completely lost because there's just, there's not a, a place that they can go where there's just really curated information, right? We have mm-hmm. no skin in this game. We're a nonprofit. All we want to do is make information that has been vetted by scientists and doctors available. So at the most superficial level, it would be like, here's what PCOS is. Here's, you know, the Wikipedia style entry and link out to places that we've vetted that have real good information. Like we don't have to write all this or curate it. We can curate it. But then at the mm-hmm. second level is like, if you want to dig down and say, okay, what do we know? What do we not know? Like, what are the open questions? Um, and what's the most cutting edge research happening right now? And that's a place where we can really make make an impact, I think, by just um, by both curating um, and linking out to other things, but also then like saying, like, here's this paper that was just published. Here's what it shows. Here's what it does not show, like without any hype or, you know, I think a lot mm-hmm. of science is often overhyped by the media. <clears throat> and that's, you know, does a disservice to the people who are like trying to get the information. Um, and then if you want to dig down even deeper, like here's the actual scientific articles. And if you want to read them, here they are. Um, so, yeah. So what else were you going to tell me about? And, and this the story you just told 
common. It's so common that yeah, women go terrible. to their doctors and their doctors don't have an answer for them. Yeah, the when I hear I don't know after a certain amount of time, it irritates me enough where I have to find out the solution. So like I try to I try not to hear. Uh, I try to curate what type of problems I hear or else I'll, I'll literally just go mad trying to solve everything throughout the day. And so, um, so eventually they got into a good state. Uh, one, anyone out there who's suffering for something, this is like a cool little tip, write down what your, your problems you're having. And if you can like have a calendar with it, it it's like, it, it, it helps uh, guide the conversation. But, um, yeah, I just, it was irritating me to the point where like, I almost like stopped what I was doing and it was like, how, how could I build? some type of machine learning application that would like scan all the images and then determine, you know, like endometri- like to differentiate the, the different ways and all these other things. Cause it just, it, it bothered me that so many people are, are not being heard. Like they, it just, they just happen to have someone they can talk to with me, but how many people out there, like you're saying, like they don't have anyone and it made me really sad. And um, at least in these cases, I think all of them got on a, on a good scenario. I think a part of it's like, sometimes a doctor says, Hey, I think maybe we should do something. And people don't hear, hey, maybe we should do something. They hear, you have to do something because right. it's a doctor. And so I think just like saying like, hey, no, you're supposed to ask questions. Like you go in there with questions. Yeah. I think that's a big yes. thing that, that helps. Um, we're putting yeah. together a clinical advisory board because, you know, to be perfectly clear, I have a PhD. I'm not a medical mm-hmm. doctor. Um, but we're putting together a clinical advisory board full of MDs that um, we want to have them help us in two ways. One is to... Um, to put resources out there, like you just said. So if you're a woman in this age range, here's like at the most superficial level, <laughs> here's yeah. a half a sheet of questions that you need to print out and take with you to your doctor. Oh, that's right? amazing. And then, but on the doctor side too, if you're a doctor treating a woman in this age range, here are the, the like 10 things you need to check. And then on both sides, like if you want to dig down a little bit, like here's like all the analysis. And then if you want to dig down and even deeper, here's like the, the primary literature. But just to have that, like, because again, I think doctors, obviously they want to help their patients, but you know, with limited time and limited resources, like what are you going to do? So if there's something that's like really easy um, to access, I, I hope that'll help. Um, the other oh, well. piece of it is the training, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of room to to include more information just about women's health in general in the first four years of medical school. So, you know, we're going to try to like, we're going to try to um, get the med school curriculum changed. Um, <laughs> and then there's, I think there's there's opportunities at, at much bigger levels too for lobbying and for really asking for, you know, just like having a bigger vision. Like for example, mm-hmm why don't we have a national institute on women's health right if you go to the nih and you want to apply for a grant related to women's health the primary place you go is nichd which is the national institute for childhood health and human development um so there's a piece of that that's carved out for most of women's health um nia has recently the national institute on aging has some grants around um reproductive aging which is amazing but but like and and so they like kind of spread around the different institutes, but there's, you know, a lot of different institutes, at the NIH, there's an office of women's health. Um, mm-hmm. But there's no like, there's no institute that is devoted to women's health. And I, I feel like now's the time. So mm-hmm. no, <laughs> yeah. I, I think just to touch on one thing is that not now, now, I don't think it's a you hope I, I would I would say confidently, you're going to alleviate so much suffering, having that knowledge based resource. For people to go and read and go deep when they're when you're scared and you don't know what to do and you have google that's you know dr google is now we should be doing they should be listening to people who know what they're talking about so i i i, I, I it's not up yet when would that type of thing be up is that like a 2023 oh, by the end um i mean we're putting things on it, it exists now but we're just putting okay. in the different topics as we as we <laughs> as we get them done and you know we're relying on um not just ourselves, but we're relying on this huge network of people now that we built out over the last few years, doctors and scientists and who, you know, who are expert in their specific areas. Um, so yeah, we're just going to keep, we're going to keep, we're just going to build it and keep building it as we go along. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think we're also very equally important is like, we don't need to be the authoritative voice here. We just want to curate all the information in a way that is, um, reliable. And so um, there are other, like we're linking to, we have a page called um, Trusted Partners and we're gonna link to anyone we think has, has content that is, um, 
that is really good and that also is not trying to sell you something. <laughs> um, so for example, like for endometriosis and um, stuff related to the uterus, there's a brand new um, uh, page called Uterine Kind. Actually, they interviewed me for a podcast not that long ago. Um, and they're curating a lot of really good information around like uteruses. And there's um, a nonprofit that started around the same time as the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality called um, the National Menopause Foundation, which is also curating um, lots of good information, but also providing a, um, a something that we're not going to do, which is to provide a, a community for women who want to talk to each other <laughs> about what's happening. <laughs> to them. Um, and so, yeah, we're just, I, I think there, like I said, there's a revolution going on right now, just in terms of how much attention is being paid to women and women's health. And so, um, and there's a lot of amazing uh, things being built. And so we're going to link, we're just going to just try to collect it all in one place and, and give people a place where they can know that, yeah, that, that, that somebody who's a scientist or a doctor has looked at this and um, and we're not trying to sell anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then what is the, that URL so people can check it out? And I definitely recommend everyone check it out. Oh, um, our website is gcrle.org. So it's the Global okay. Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, which is a mouthful. Um, but I think every piece of that is important. And especially that word equality, because, you know, the fact that women go through this reproductive decline in midlife it impacts every aspect of their adult lives, right? Whether you want to have biological children or not, um, you know, this is something that that you have to consider in every decision you make as an adult woman. Um, it's like that ticking biological clock in the background. It's always there. And then when you get closer to menopause, right? Like I'm just about there uh, to perimenopause, which is this huge period of time that nobody knows how long it is or what starts it or really even what happens during it. But what we do know is bad things happen. And um, there's a lot of symptoms in perimenopause that really impact like a woman's ability to function in her everyday life. So there really, like there truly is an aspect of equality here that it makes men and women very different. And I, I really feel like now is the time to, to tackle this. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm all for it. I, I hope all the listeners so far have been enthralled by this because it is not something that gets talked about um yeah that's as what a guy, i said I had to i'm have... trying just like all i want to do is just t talk about it that's that's yeah. that's a big piece of the puzzle yeah um so are there any books because uh, I, I think we're over in the drop zone and i don't want to get in trouble for us today uh are, are there any books that you'd recommend people check out it could be on the subject or just be things that you enjoy reading i will oh. i will buy them i will read them <laughs> oh gosh i wasn't prepared to talk about books um well, actually, I can say that um, a member of our center, so um, so one of the people that we have in our center here at Buck is an evolutionary biologist. And uh, we didn't really touch on all of the really interesting questions around like, why in the world does this happen anyways? To, to like, why do human females do this? It's like a reproductive yeah, strategy weird. that most animals don't do. So what the heck? Um, but she's, uh, she's just written a book that's going to be published in August. Um, that's for the popular, like for non-scientists, it's, um, about the evolution of the female form. And so she's a PhD scientist who studied the evolution of pregnancy and the evolution of menstruation during her PhD and her postdoc. And now she's interested in the evolution of menopause. And it is fascinating to think about why, like how and why the different parts of the female body, human female body evolved um so that book uh, <laughs> which will come out in a few months um and then i would say there's not a lot of there hasn't been a lot of literature written around this um you know I, I, books i don't know um we have a lot of uh you know we have a white paper and a mission statement and um mm -hmm. i've written a lot of articles but um but yeah there's not like a single book that i i know of there's some cool books around like it's kind of depressing though there's a really cool book around um uh just women in data so you know you were asking about um about why clinical trials don't don't have as many women um I'm trying to remember what it's called um i think it's called invisible woman yeah data bias mm -hmm. at a world designed for men um that is what is on my bedside table right now and i'm rereading it because it's a it's a it's a really it's not I wouldn't call it dense, but it's a really um, 
well-researched book and um it it's a few years old but it's really it 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 every time i read it i learn something new sweet and then um uh i'm gonna check out both and add it i'm making like a master list of every book that's ever recommended on my podcast and so cool. far it's like it, it it's it's ridiculous <laughs> there's so many <laughs> Cool. And I've read well, we can uh, link like to that list. Of them. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we can link to that list. But thank you for having yeah. me. I appreciate it. That was a fun conversation. The, uh, if it's okay, I have a, like a couple of fan write-in questions. But if, sure. if we have to end, that's fine. Okay. Um, so uh, this person has weird names. All right. So Li- Lizzie Hales Legs. <laughs> Why did you make this your username? Okay. Uh, looking at her past work, she seems to be to often be ahead of the curve or in the minority in terms of research topics that she's working on and in aging <laughs> field in particular, she focused on studying topics that aren't popular, but are obviously extremely important in the, for the field. So my question is, how does she identify unique novel topics to study? What have been her keys to success with advocating for the pursuit of undervalued areas of research? Oh, wow. That's a very insightful question. Um, what was it? Legs? <laughs> L- Lizzie Hale's legs. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, thank you. Lizzie I don't know who Hale's Lizzie Hale is. <laughs> Um, I feel like we should probably both know. Maybe you can look her up while I'm talking. Uh, Okay, I'll look it up. uh, But that's a very uh, that's a very kind question, actually. Um, uh, Well, I have um, I have a pretty diverse training background. My PhD was in chemistry and chemical biology. So when I, you know, I my undergrad was was um, uh, molecular and cell biology, and really looking at like biophysical models of like proteins at the molecular level. And um, when I started my PhD, I had this kind of somewhat naive idea that um, if I could make molecules, like if I could do synthetic organic chemistry as a biologist, I would kind of like rule the world. And um, I wasn't, I mean, it was a sort of a naive idea, but I actually, I'm so glad that I um, did chemistry because it gave me a perspective that not a lot of people have. And um, that was where I first got introduced to bioactive peptides. So um, I worked on this fungal natural product, which was this like really complex, crazy, cyclic depsy peptide, this giant, crazy looking molecule. And um, my project was to understand what it was doing in cells, like how it was working. And that led me down a really interesting path um, that I won't talk about. But when I was looking around to decide what to do in my postdoc, um, I really wanted to learn something new. And I always encourage students, um, one of the other hats I wear is that I help with the PhD program here in the biology of aging. And I always encourage students when they're moving into their postdocs to really like push the envelope in terms of like changing what they're thinking about. Because it's so rare that you have the opportunity, that you're given the opportunity to learn something and become expert in it from beginning to end. And that's what your postdoc is, that's what your PhD is. But you can do it in different places. So when I was looking around for a postdoc, um, I had two criteria. One was that I wanted to work for um, someone who was an amazing mentor. And the other was that I wanted to do something completely different. And so I just like cast about and found a bunch of different things I thought were cool. Um, And again, sort of naively, um, interviewed in a lot of different labs. And I chose the lab I chose because number one, the science was cool, but number two, cool mentor. Um, And, uh, and I really felt like uh, neuroscience was, you know, the brain is kind of like the last unexplored object in the universe. So Mm -hmm. um, I had never taken a class in neuroscience when I started my postdoc. And so there's a very steep learning curve. And I probably had to work a lot harder than other people who had that background. But um, but then I worked on neural circuits and behavior in C. elegans, that nematode you were talking about. And um, I had never seen a C. elegans in person until I interviewed in that lab. Um, so part of it is just being comfortable with uncertainty and, and also being willing to like be the person in the room who didn't know anything um, and, you know, like just be humble. But also, I think now when I started my own lab, everything that we do is framed through the lens of my unique training background and nobody else has Mm -hmm. that background. And so um, coming from the outside um, into neuroscience, one of the things, one of the benefits that afforded me is that I didn't have all the weird biases and hang ups that people who had been training in that field for their whole careers had. Um, Mm -hmm. So, for example, peptidergic signaling, I remember when I started working on it in like 2007 in my postdoc, my mentor, 
Corey said, you know, most neuroscientists think of the hypothalamus as a backwater and they don't, they think of like neuropeptides as kind of like mother's little helper. Like, you know, they're there to like help um, amplify or modulate the signal, the, the, the important signal, which would be like those classical neurotransmitters. And of course, since 2007, the, everyone has come around to the idea that they're super important. But at the time she was like, you know, if there were a lot of people who sort of neuroscientists who didn't think this was interesting or exciting. Um, but so because I was coming from outside, I had a different perspective. And then I was very fortunate um, as a, you know, as a junior professor to get that MIRA grant from the NIH. I can't, I can't emphasize how pivotal that was. If I had gotten a, a regular R01, which is the funding mechanism that most people apply for and get, those are the, like, the very prescribed three specific aims must do these mm -hmm. things in this order and show progress on them. Um, but I got this award that allowed me the freedom to basically follow the science. Um, and so that, that really, um, and, and also I'm at a place that, uh, that lets me do a lot of things that maybe I wouldn't be able to do at a large medical school. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I just, I honestly, I think, um, if, if my lab is working on a question or a problem, Problem and someone else can be doing the same set of experiments or competing with us, then why are we doing it? Like everything mm -hmm. that we do needs to be like a question that only we could ask or, um, or what's the point, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, that was a nice question. Thank you. Like, yeah. And L Lizzie's Lizzie Hale's like, apparently she's a singer. Oh, she has okay. like a big electric guitar. Okay, I would cool. share it, but I don't know how to do that. Um, okay. well then, uh, I, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, everyone listening in, I want to encourage you to be curious, check out uh, all the links that are going to be in the show notes and learn about these things. Like this is important stuff. And uh, selfishly, you know, go ask your sister. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> go ask your sister how's menopause coming for, uh, depending on you know, the age. Um, but yeah, I want, thank you again for coming on the show. And Allison, thanks again for uh, setting this up. Yeah, thanks, Allison. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.